Hi, I'm Christopher Ray, and welcome to the first of three video lectures about Zhang Guixing's novel, My South Seas Sleeping Beauty. In this video lecture, I want to talk about the South Seas as a type of cultural imaginary, one that I think Zhang Guixing is working against and working with in several ways. And I say that it's a Chinese imaginary because this is one that is partly a type of inscription on landscape, the whole swath of Southeast Asia, a place of Chinese migration from China, but also a place that to the people who live there and maybe are descendants of Chinese emigres is a place with its own culture. In this video lecture, I want to argue that the South Seas is not just a setting, it is also a character in its own right. The Chinese title of Zhang Guixing's novel, My South Sea Sleeping Beauty, is Nan Guo, meaning Southern Kingdom. And I'll talk a little bit about that term in a minute. But Nan Guo is also related to a broader imaginary of Nanyang, meaning the South Seas. So I think the first question is, what's in a name? I think this is not just an actual physical place, this is also an imagined place. This novel underscores that the connections between things Chinese, whether they are places or people or customs or language, and Southeast Asia are multiple. So in this video lecture, we can start to open up this imaginary space a little bit. I'll then bring us into the novel itself, which could be considered a work of historical fiction because it intertwines the lives of these fictional characters, this fictional family, and some actual historical events. So we have events real and imagined in here. So we'll meet the characters and see how chapter one sets the tone. I am arguing that the South Seas is a character and not just a place or a setting because it has its own agency. Does it have its own consciousness or will? That's a separate question, but we can see for sure that it affects the characters, the human beings in the novel, as well as the natural world. It does things to people, including affecting their consciousness and their perceptual state. This is an argument that I just want to open up here and that will develop in the later video lectures. This passage is one of the first indications that Zhang Guixing is treating the South Seas as something of a person or a character, that fat beauty. This is a bodily presence that is clearly gendered as female and is one that is completely overpowering. It smears with grease, it has all of these tendrils that go in different places. There are endless rivers of blood arterial sclerosis. This is something that gets inside you. Nanyang literally means the South Seas. It's an oceanic metaphor, you could say. It literally means Southern Ocean or oceans. It should not be confused with the South China Sea, not least because it refers to land as well as to ocean. So it's a common term for this broad geographic region that other people refer to as Southeast Asia. Again, it's not exactly the same as Southeast Asia, but we can generally think of it as referring to that area particularly one that has been settled and has many migrants and descendants of people from China. When we're dealing with directions or coordinates like north, south, east, west, there's also a presumed center. And in this case, we're talking about the Middle Kingdom, Zhongguo, or the central states, or the Zhongyuan, the central plains of China. And so there's a presumed north, south, east, and west of that place. However, as soon as you start looking at what the terms have traditionally been applied to, you can see we're not talking about actual places here. We're talking about imagined places that don't map exactly with our coordinates. So Xi'an is to the west. Is it across the Pacific or is it in the other direction west of China, past Central Asia towards Europe? Dongyang, Japan. Japan is indeed just to the east of China. But then you also have Beiyang, which is often refers to kind of the Shandong Peninsula and the area actually in the east of China, but is a little bit further on the north side near the Yellow Sea. This is a term that has been applied to the government that ruled China in the 1910s and 1920s. And this notion in the Chinese speaking world that there is a central place and that it is surrounded by four seas is one that goes back over 2000 years. You can see in this map, which highlights Indonesia, the large island of Borneo. Borneo is a significant place. It's a large island one of the largest in the world, if you exclude Australia and some other continents. It also has a large population of about 21 million people. Sarawak is one of two Malaysian states on Borneo. It is on the northwestern part. This is where the author Zhang Guixing was born, and it is often referred to as the land of the hornbills. This is a bird that is mentioned in the novel, and it is home to a significant population of ethnic Chinese. Borneo today is an island of three nations, including part of Indonesia, part of Malaysia, and the entirety of the Kingdom of Brunei. Brunei was a British protectorate during the time when the novel is set. And you'll note that in the novel, Su Chi's home is just across the river from Brunei, and there's a lot of traffic, especially by pleasure seekers moving back and forth, but also by a mysterious prince. 
Borneo is also a place with a colonial history and a post-colonial present. In the parts of the novel set in Borneo, everything is taking place in a British protectorate or colony. And this is a colony in the midst of a guerrilla war. There is a communist insurgency against British rule on the island. And this insurgency was not just confined to the island. It was also on the Malayan Peninsula. This was a conflict that involved not just Commonwealth soldiers from the United Kingdom or Australia, but also Dayak tribes people fighting on the side of the Commonwealth forces and against the predominantly ethnically Chinese Malayan National Liberation Army, this pro-communist, pro-liberation outfit. This was a guerrilla war that took place in two phases. The first phase was against the British, primarily during the colonial period. Then after Malaysian independence in 1957, there was a renewed insurgency, which lasted the longest in Sarawak, ending in 1990. The years 1989 and 90 also saw the collapse of many communist regimes, states, and movements around the world. Dayak is a term that has been applied to over 200 different indigenous groups within the island of Borneo. Groups that have different languages, different customs, different habits. The custom of headhunting is one that is mentioned during the novel. My South Sea Sleeping Beauty includes many Dayak characters who kind of come in and out of the forest and in and out of the narrative. Two of the ones that I think are most significant are those that have relationships with both father and mother. So to speak very, very generally, Nanyang could be thought of as a part of the Chinese cultural imaginary that has a few key components to it. One is that it is a geographic region, and it's also a region where people, Chinese people, go to out of necessity. That they, when they have to leave the Middle Kingdom because of poverty or to seek opportunities, this is one of the places that they go to. They may be refugees or opportunists or fortune seekers. There are multiple terms that have been used to refer to the so-called Chinese of Southeast Asia, such as Peranakan or Straits Chinese or Baba Nonya. We could say that these historical ties have given rise to a sense of Chinese ownership of a kind, not official ownership necessarily, but kind of a cultural ownership or that there's been a cultural Chinese imprint on this territory. Like many overseas stories, the story of Nanyang in Chinese language sources has often been talked about as one of adventure and peril. And there's the real life case of the writer Yu Da Fu, who had visited Japan, he had been a literary celebrity in China, and then spent part of the war years down in Singapore, in Malaya, and other parts of Southeast Asia. And he went missing during the latter years of World War II, supposedly killed by the Japanese in the jungles of Borneo. And there have been a lot of attempts to figure out what happened to Yu Da Fu. As I mentioned in the previous video lecture about Zhang Gui Xing and Sinophone Malaysian writers, there's also been a 1988 film that reimagines the legend of Yu Da Fu. But Yu Da Fu's case is important in another sense, and that he was regarded as a great master of modern Chinese literature. And he made this claim in 1939, so during the war years, that if the Nanyang can produce a great master, an author who puts the South Seas at the heart of his works, composing them effectively by the tens or hundreds, then Nanyang literature, a literature with local South Seas flavor, will naturally succeed. But he's kind of coming at it from a China-centric point of view and saying that it takes an authority like me to recognize the presence of a great Nanyang literature. And so this is a very problematic and very Chinese-centric worldview. There have been other ways of talking about Nanyang, including in Zhang Weixing's stories, that put Nanyang at the center, not at the south. Cultural imaginaries can also give rise to things like military action, and I think the contemporary geopolitics are worth keeping in mind here. The People's Republic of China in recent years has claimed the South China Sea, a lot of territorial waters in so-called Nanyang, as being its maritime territory. So this is a type of maritime expansionism that is partly based on these cultural claims of having always already been there. What is beyond a doubt, however, is that Nanyang and Malaysia in particular are important sites of Chinese language cultural production. In the previous video lecture, I gave a lot of literary examples, which you can take a look at. I would also highlight that in the world of cinema, you have stars such as Michelle Yeoh and Tsai Ming Liang, the director who is from Malaysia, now makes his home in Taiwan. The long title of Zhang Guixing's work, My South Sea Sleeping Beauty, packs a lot into it. It refers to not a Nanyang, not the oceans, but a Nanguo, a southern kingdom, that has a princess in it. And who this princess is, is a very good question. This is a work whose storytelling is as labyrinthine as the garden cultivated by Su Qi's mother. And so I think it helps to have just a list of some of the key characters here. This is certainly not all of them, but this is some of the people who appear again and again. In presenting this list, I've tried to be careful not to include too many plot spoilers. 
but there will be some to come in the future video lectures, so be sure that you read the novel to the end first. Similarly, we could take a historical chronology and some of the events of the novel and put them side by side to see what exactly is happening when. But this is just a few examples from parts one and part two of the novel. Actually, a lot of the dating that we get for events in the novel comes in part three. And so this unfolding is not linear in any sense. We get an imaginary of the South Seas which is not constrained by historical chronology. In the opening chapter, we encounter a family in crisis. Su Chi's little sister has died under mysterious circumstances. There are multiple accounts of how she died. None of them are certain. Mother starts mourning her obsessively, including holding the corpse in her arms until it starts to rot and stink. She becomes pregnant by a Dayak tribesman. We don't know exactly what the circumstances were there either. Once her son is born, Su Chi's father murders the infant, and this precipitates the final split between mother and father, who continue to coexist but there's irreparable harm done to their already fraying relationship. So right away, sleep and death are closely linked. We don't know if the baby died in its sleep or if it died because the mother fell asleep. This garden also has soporific effects and later seems to have some power over life and death. We have extreme cruelty with infanticide and a husband torturing a wife. We also have this underlying feeling of uncertainty. We don't know exactly what has happened or when or how. There are all of these conflicting stories and tales and things don't get any clearer as the chapters progress.